German immigrants would have passed through uh, Indiana all those years ago, uh, including uh, the Schramms. So the Schramms uh, were uh, the, the original founders of this winery. Uh, they built the home that you see there in that one shot, and then a number of uh, other uh, redwood buildings that are still here on this property, uh, planted what were the first hillside vineyards uh, in this area. Uh, and that was in 1862, so kind of uh, crazy to think of German immigrants uh, planting grapes and making uh, some delicious wine uh, in the midst of the Civil War all those years ago. So my parents would arrive here in 1965, revive this, this particular site. Uh, it had been closed since Prohibition, so it actually had like a 50-year run of activity and then a 50-year period of being closed. And now we've been going for another 55 years, uh, building a, a really a successful brand as a very premium sparkling wine producer in California. So doing the traditional method with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, a bottle fermentation, uh, aging, and we're going to taste through three of our delicious uh, sparkling wines today. I've got three. I think some of you may have that exact same set or maybe you have a, a, a slightly different version, but we're, we'll talk really about our Blanc de Blanc, our Blanc de Noir, and our Brut Rosé. I thought it would be fun to start with the, the very first wine, the Blanc de Blanc. And I'm actually going to kick the, uh, the, the tasting off today with a little bottle savoring. Uh, this is a trick that I would recommend that you also try uh, at home. Uh, any, any flat edge, frankly, will do, but having a, a, a blade with a little heft, uh, and I'll show you the blade I've got. This is a Laguiole saver, so a, a, a French uh, maker and actually one of the few savers that is produced really for the purpose of bottle savoring. But anyhow, check this out. I'm gonna I'll move over towards this uh, door and then my sister Katie is going to be behind the scenes. She's gonna move the camera a little bit in that direction. So I'll give you a few pointers here. Uh, Okay, can you see me? I, I see myself on the screen. So one of one, 2016, uh, we're gonna run the, the, uh, the blade right up the, the length of the bottle. There's actually a, a seam on the bottle, so it's nice to identify that. Come right up the, the length of the bottle, gonna clip the lip. Effectively, I'm gonna be chopping the top of the bottle off. So that'll be kind of cool to see the top of the bottle get chopped off. And then I'll go ahead and I'll taste this guy you here. So we're, we're again up at uh, Franzburg today, around the corner, around this other side, uh, we are bottling our Blanc Noir. So that is uh, exciting. We're bottling our 2019 vintage. And again, today we'll be tasting here the 2016. So a little bit of a gray day in Napa, not too bad. We need the precipitation. It's been fairly dry this year. I've got my blade. It's about a 30 degree angle, right? A one. Base hit swing, not a home run. Just a nice, nice run right through. One, two, three. There we go. Just like that. So there it is. All right. So I, I hear the applause uh, in the kind of virtual because I, you guys all have your microphones off, but. If anybody did want to turn the microphone on and say, hey, that, that looked pretty cool, uh, that would be okay too. Um, but here I'm going to pour myself a little of the Blanc de Blanc. That was very cool. That was very good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I feel like it's Friday. I've been doing lots of virtual tastings on Friday. Um, but it's actually Thursday, right? You guys have to remind me. So it's not bad to, uh, to do this on Thursday as well. So you can see the top of the bottle got chopped right off. And it's really just coming off the lip with the blade. You'll hit the hit the lip, keep on going. You want to follow through, and it'll literally uh, chop the top of the bottle uh, straight Thank off. Thank you. Liz wants yes, to know how many times you've had to practice that. Well, uh, a couple of times. Uh, I started probably in my teens. I was a little bit younger. 
and now I'm 54. So I, think of, uh, uh, I would say I'm in the thousands at this stage. Uh, and uh, in this era of uh, kind of virtual uh, video, uh, virtual tasting, they can, uh, tomorrow will probably happen a couple times would be my yeah. guess. I, I haven't got there yet, but probably. Uh, anyhow. Thank you for joining us. We'll go ahead and talk about this wine a little bit, the, uh, the Blanc de Blanc. And again, um, here, the, the wine that we started with, uh, the first wine that we would produce back in 1965, 100% uh, Chardonnay. Uh, so with that, really the only wine that we've produced that is 100% varietal. Uh, typically, we, uh, we like Chardonnay so much, we use some of it in our rosés, in our Blanc Noir. Uh, but in the Blanc de Blanc, we, we just go ahead and, 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 and use Chardonnay only for, for this purpose. Uh, the grape is probably better known for still wine, right? Uh, typically the, the Chardonnay uh, will, would be picked at, a, at a, a riper moment in the harvest uh, with, with a little less of the vibrant acidity and uh, ultimately making a, a higher alcohol style of wine than this. What I do like about this Chardonnay is that it is very lean, very crisp, very tart, uh, very palate cleansing. I find that the sommeliers who often think of California wines as maybe being a too, too uh, rich forward and, and ripe, uh, are, are impressed with the, the, the brisk, kind of vibrant, energetic character of this particular style. Our most popular style, uh, the, 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 this particular wine represents almost 40% of our overall production. Uh, and it's always been vintage dated, a little bit different than some of the, the French producers from from France, or, or there are a few of those uh, here in California as well, where maybe a non-vintage brut would be the, the principal wine of the house. For Transburg, it's actually always been a vintage dated uh, Chardonnay based uh, a wine, or, or Blanc de Blanc. Uh, 16, pretty outstanding vintage in California. Uh, I know that the, the critics have raved about it in general uh, for, for Cabernet. Um, we're thankful for that. We, we make some delicious Cabernet as well. And, and uh, you know, sometimes I think that the, the vintage is considered for Cabernet more than for other things. But I can tell you a little bit about this year. Uh, it was the first year in, in five uh, that was not a drought or was not preceded by a, a drought. So the, 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 the winters before 12, 13, 14, and 15 were all very dry years. And uh, ultimately, with each successive year, we had less crop, we had less growth in the vineyard, and uh, we had an earlier season. By the time we got to 16, we ended up with a normal amount of rainfall, but it still behaved a little like a, a dry season. It's as if you, you have a plant and, and you're uh, not watering it very much, and then you remember, oh yeah, we should water it a little bit. The plant is happy, but it doesn't immediately start uh, uh, growing quickly. Uh, with that said, the yields were fairly low. Uh, the harvest, again, relatively early, which I think might play well into the hand of the Cabernet producer. For the sparkling wine guy, um, we found ourselves uh, very pleased with this vintage. A little bit more dense in terms of the, the flavor profile, uh, maybe a little softer with, with its acidity, but with that said, it is uh, going to be very brisk uh, each and every year. Uh, for those of you uh, thinking of this style, we also do it in half bottles. And then if you're ever interested in a larger format bottle, we do Magnums, Jeroboam's, which are three liter size and nine liter uh, size uh, bottles of this as well. So that nine liter of Salamanazar is you know, more than waist high on me. So a very, very large uh, bottle. But uh, I love this wine. I would recommend it highly with uh, oysters on the half shell that, that, that generally are uh, available in, in restaurants around the country, right? Um, things that, uh, might have a, a, a citrus component uh, in terms of the, the, the dish. Smoked salmon comes to mind, delicious. Uh, uh, say fried calamari, uh, delicious. But it can also go beautifully with, um, you know, something that's much more simple than that, you know, uh, a, you know charcuterie and cheeses. Uh, I typically go probably with, with more tart cheeses at that, but uh, something that's a little more creamy might be an interesting counterpoint. Um, nuts, dried fruits, etc. Cheers. I'll have a sip. I needed that. All right. Very good. So that one is our Blanc de Blanc. To give you a, a little bit of a sense for the, the, the history of the property, and I'm not sure some of you may have, have been here before or have some sense for it, talked a little bit about the, the, the founders. So on the left-hand side of the screen there, you have 
uh, shots of uh, uh, Jacob and Anashram. Uh, then there's the shot of the, the cave, actually, which is uh, very close to where I'm currently sitting. Uh, but this is a picture from well over 100 years ago. Uh, interesting, this property has uh, uh, about 35,000 uh, square feet of underground uh, storage tunnels, uh, where many of which were dug in 1800s. We've added on to those caves since then. Uh, we are currently filling the caves with our 19 vintage. Uh, and at the end of our bottling season, there will actually be some 3 million bottles representing many vintages, I should say, uh, in those caves. This year we'll put about 100,000, or excuse me, uh, we'll put about a million bottles in the caves just this, this very year. Um, with something like the Blanc de Blanc, we'll age this in for about uh, two, two, two plus years in, in, in the caves. We can't uh, riddle and disgorge every bottle on the same day, so some will We'll spend a little more time in the caves than others, but that's typically the, the age of the style. And, and when it's finally released, it'll be three to four years old as it, as it sits in the market. I uh, talked about my parents, uh, Jack and Jamie Davies, uh, reviving the property in 65 uh, with this particular uh, series of images. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm, I might be blocking. Let me see if I move that. There you go. Now that's, unfortunately, my mom is not in the picture, but that's my dad. And then uh, my three brothers and I, I'm the guy with a little uh, red uh, jumpsuit on there. And then you'll see me on the far right, uh, actually with my wife and our three kids. There's my mom, sorry, she's in between those two pictures. Um, but she and my, my dad moved up from Southern California. Uh, they had met in San Francisco, actually in, in uh, 1959, uh, met, got married, and by uh, 65, they had uh, taken on this adventure of, of starting a, a winery in, in Napa and so north the, north of San Francisco uh, first winery to do this style of wine in the United States actually so a very very adventurous project for them uh, a couple of other highlights on this page include the 72 tasting in, in Beijing China uh, so Nixon was a president uh, from uh, the great state of California and uh, the first actually president from California but also the first sitting president to ever go to China and so it was at that moment uh, when the Vietnamese war was going on and uh, we were obviously supporting one side and the Chinese the other that there was a historic uh, um, a series of meetings and at the end of that series of meetings there was a, a toast of peace. Uh, peace didn't really come to pass for another couple of years but it was exciting for us to have our transfer a blank to blank actually was the way that Barbara Walters uh, <laughs> explained uh, that was served uh, uh, that morning. So my parents actually were told to turn on the television that Barbara Walters had explained that to a, a NBC audience that the, the transfer blank to blank had been served. We sold the 13 cases to the State Department about three weeks in advance and no one, no one actually even knew that the president was in China until it was done, which is kind of interesting, but that was a, a different time. But we'll raise a glass to, uh, to, to, to that earlier history. Our wines have been served in, uh, in different historic occasions uh, since that time. Uh, and by, I think, nine different presidents up, up to this stage. Most recently, actually, it was our Cremon Demisec that was served when the president from France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and his wife, uh, Brigitte, visited the White House. Uh, that was last year. Mm -hmm. So we can go ahead and, and jump to the to the next slide, if you hey, like. Hey, Hugh, just real quick. Um, which, yep. has, has the, which wine has been the most used at the White House? Was, has it been the Blanc de Blanc? No, the probably over all these years, and it's happened close to 100 times, uh, the Cremant Demisec. So often the sparkling wine will be served at the very end of a meal, mm -hmm. and then uh, they'll like to use it for the, the celebratory toast, if you will. And uh, at that point, maybe a Demisec, an off-dry sparkling style, would, uh, would be a better fit. And, and so that's, that's, that's kind of how it's happened. Most recently, I referred to the... Uh, the, the, the Trump Macron uh, uh, dinner, and they served the Charanger Crema Demi Sec with the, uh, with the nectarine tart and uh, creme fraiche. So, a relatively simple uh, dessert, but it, it sounds just about perfect for the purpose of uh, pairing with that wine. Uh, this one would, the Blanc de Blanc, you could serve a dessert if you like, but I would think more typically this being a very energetic, crisp, bright tart style, it will sit at the beginning of the meal, this would be the, the more the aperitif as, as well. Uh, I think of it like when, when you might wanna have a really crisp tart white wine, 
that would be a moment when you'd want to have a really crisp tart sparkling wine. You know, not too much different. This is a not as full bodied as, as Chardonnay simply are. Uh, some some Sauvignon Blancs, frankly, may may be more reminiscent of the the, the, the weight and the and the, the tartness of, of this style. This one probably even would be a little bit more lean and tart than than a, a very lean tart uh, Sauvignon. Blanc. Hugh, we, uh, we, go ahead. We've got a question about terroir, but I think we'll get to that when we go through the vineyards. Do you want to? Yeah, if you want to jump to the next slide, that might give us a chance to uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so so as we go through this video, I'll, uh, I'll kind of give, uh, I'll talk as we go through it. So go ahead and click on that. Transferred can you see, is- Can you see it? it? Can you see the video? I cannot, no. Okay. I cannot, but I can, I can, I can show you, well, let's it's see now. The, it's the technical difficulties that we'll experience, but I'm gonna see if I can't pull it back up. If it doesn't work, the, the other video that is, uh, that is what looks like on the PowerPoint uh, in slide seven slot, that one would also be pretty cool to look at. Okay, we'll show, hopefully we'll be able to show both. Let's see if I can get this one going. If not, we'll go to the next one. Okay, but as, as uh, to I that question, I'll, I'll, I'll let you see about tweaking the, the video and see if that works. I can, I can to speak to, to what that video would show. Um, we do have a range of vineyards that we work with, uh, something like, uh, what you you see in say the Champagne District of France, where where uh, for those who've uh, who enjoy champagnes and have studied that region, there are uh, there are really kind of three distinct uh, principal pockets. You have the Cote Blanc, you have the Montandarins, you have the Valley de Le Marne, um, each uh, giving a, a slightly different aspect uh, to 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 the to the to the blend, if you will, uh, of, of champagne. And, and many of the houses have vineyards. In each of these different pockets, they they may have a, a maison. You know, they may have a a, a house where the, the wine is made that is in one location. But they work with a range of vineyards from the broader area. Uh, that broader area, the 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 the, kind of the size of the Champagne district, is uh, is isn't necessarily replicated. But the the size of our area that we work with is is similar in terms of the overall size. We're working with vineyards in uh, Napa County, uh, but more specifically in that Carneros district. So very at the southern end of the, the Napa Valley, uh, straddling over into the to the Sonoma side. Um, yeah, now it looks like this one is picking up. So we'll, we'll talk about this more specifically. There you see California. So uh, Napa and Sonoma, North uh, California, north of the San Francisco Bay. Um, you can see where the Schramsberg Winery is physically located, a little further north in Napa. Uh, that's where I'm sitting today, and that's where we make our sparkling wines. Uh, but as 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 we've evolved, we've we've grown to and evolved to grow Cabernet actually on the the hillside, the old hillside where the the caves and the, the sparkling wine facility are. Uh, our Chardonnay and Pinot Noirs, this map will show you, come from uh, cooler pockets closer to the bay. Uh, so we think of the, the Carneros region just at the north end of the San Francisco Bay there. Uh, and then as we as we make our way up the coast, and you can maybe pause right there. This gives mm -hmm. us a pretty nice overview. But as we go up that coast, uh, we're working with vineyards in Marin County. So the, the, the county is uh, really a peninsula uh, that just sits just above the city of San Francisco on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Not a lot of vineyards planted there. Uh, we didn't uh, start working in that area until uh, 1990, uh, and, and Chardonnay and Pinot can work. Uh, it's, it's actually the coolest pocket of the, the range of sites that, that, that we're working with. As you climb up the coast and, and as we go through this little, little map, you'll get a sense for uh, some of the other pockets that we're working with up the Sonoma coast, uh, through the Petaluma Gap, uh, into the uh, Sebastopol, kind of Green Valley, Occidental, uh, Freestone area. We're also working further north up into the uh, north of the, the Russian River, uh, and, and then eventually all the way up into the Anderson Valley in, in Mendocino County. So you can go ahead and slide if you want to there, okay. Jenny.
There you go. So over a hundred different individual blocks will make well over 300 individual uh, sparking base wines every year with which we craft our blends, which may sound like a lot. Uh, we're, we're pretty energetic and enthusiastic about what we do. Uh, and so we, we take on that, that challenge each and every year. Now on this property, this is the home property. This is where I'm physically located. You can pause just for a second there, but that's up at the north end of Napa. You see Calistoga off to the, to the right on the map. And our, our home property is nestled in the, the, the volcanic soils of, of the, the, the Diamond Mountain District, actually. So we're just on the Napa side of, of the Mayacamas Range here in the Diamond Mountain District. And uh, there we do have about 46 acres of, of Cabernet. Uh, on a different day, we can, we can talk about the delicious J. Davies Cabernet program mm. that we make from uh, those vineyards. But go ahead, Jenny, and keep on going. We'll head up a little further north. Um, we do produce a couple of delicious Pinot Noirs. This one is a Nobles Vineyard in the Fort Ross Seaview uh, Appalachian. So very close to the coast, but very high. This is a part of the coast that jumps straight out of the ocean there. And then uh, we also work with a little range of vineyards up here in the Anderson Valley. So southern end of Mendocino County, one of the, the, the vineyard desert Pinots we do is this Farrington Pinot, uh, which you can, uh, which was highlighted there. So that gives you a little bit, this is a, a kind of a cool uh, 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 map uh, uh, that we, we created uh, some years ago with, with Wilson Daniels. Jenny's gonna next take us to a video that we've done more recently that'll hopefully uh, be able to pop up. And I would go there now, that one. Okay, uh, we've can, just, you, uh, can, you, yep. can you explain AVA um, while I um, pull up the presentation? Yep, yep. So if you look back to the map that we just looked at, we looked at a number of AVAs and AVA is simply an acronym for American Viticultural Area. And so the Napa Valley was, is an AVA, but inside of the Napa Valley, there are actually 16 sub AVAs, if you will. Uh, back to my reference to Champagne, where we had the Cote de Blanc, the Montagne de Reims, and the Valley de Marne. Really, we think of our Carneros, our mm -hmm. Sonoma Coast, and we think of the Anderson Valley, and, and those are three distinct AVAs uh, in, in our part of the world that work really well for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. People think of those AVAs more for the, the still wines that are produced, but some of us are having really some tremendous success with, uh, with, the, with the sparkling wine. And so that, that has been our, our effort. Might be interesting to think of, uh, of, of our effort in that regard. We are working with, as I indicated, some 120 uh, sites, effectively none of which were planted uh, back in the 1960s when my parents started. Uh, we're working in areas that are closer to the ocean and closer to the bay where it's colder. And, and the old timers would have thought, you know, it's a little, a little harder to uh, uh, be successful in terms of uh, yields uh, and consistency in, in that, you know, kind of colder coastal uh, climate or zone, but for the standpoint of, of capturing really vibrant chard acidity and chardonnay and pinot for sparkling wines, unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, I kid the French, we may have found a better place to actually grow the, uh, the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for this purpose. Uh, we don't need to chapelize, right? So there's, there's no need to add sugar to the, to the base juice that we start out with. Uh, and, and we don't really need to acidulate either. So we're able to, to, to ripen fruit into a really, really nice balance, which hopefully you'll find in the selection that uh, we're tasting here with you. Okay, I'm going to try this because for whatever reason, my wonderful <laughs> um, PowerPoint doesn't want to allow me to um, share the video on that. So I'm gonna try something else. All right. Uh, I'm gonna try to play it from here. So are you ready to? Let I'm ready. And if the audio that? is on, then I won't speak. If the auto is not on, I'll uh, I'll kind of speak. I'll I'll help navigate on on the video. Can you can you see this? I only see your name. Okay. All right. Let me try. Okay. Let's. But it sure is a cool video. If we get a chance. I know. To see it. I love this video. I'm like just gonna be so upset. I don't, it's, 
Okay, here we go. Screens are okay. I get that. It's not imperative that we do. It would be a it would be a nice thing to have. It starts with that image right there. And then, there you go. They say yep, you yep. can't make a great vintage sparkling wine every year. Of course you can. Yeah. Having a killer set of vineyards along California's north coast allows us to make it happen. These are all cool coastal sites, producing some of the highest acid readings of any grapes grown in the world. How do we get this consistently delicious array of fruit? It's oh, oh this is terrible. All right. all right. I'm gonna try this one more time. It just doesn't want me to. There we go. They say you can't make a great vintage sparkling wine every year. Of course you can. Having a killer set of vineyards along California's north coast allows us to make it happen. These are all cool coastal sites, producing some of the highest acid readings of any grapes grown in the world. How do we get this consistently delicious array of fruit? It's the Pacific Ocean. There it is. Bang! It's a game changer. Today, we're growing an exceptional range of fruit along 140 miles of the Pacific Ocean. We work in Mendocino's Anderson Valley, the Napa Carneros, the Sonoma Coast, and even in some remote sites of West Marin County. You've got the Carneros and the loamy dark soils to the south of us. There's one block there that we replanted on our own that's nestled in next to the Hyde and Tocnady sites along the Carneros Creek. The maritime influence from the San Pablo Bay allows for really high acid retention in the Chardonnay. So then we're out in Marin County. And this area is a little less understood, I think. Now, this part of West Marin County is cold and harvest is late. Look at the Stevens Vineyard here. That's really the last vineyard we harvest. Very low yielding, very small clusters. You'll never get fruit to still wine maturity. In 2011, the Chardonnay from this vineyard only got to 16 bricks and the season was over. The leaves were falling off the vines. Heading north of Marin County, you have the vast Sonoma Coast, containing isolated pockets with great vineyards such as Kiefer, Dutton, Hawk Hill, Horseshoe Bend, Nobles. We worked with Kiefer for 20 plus years. It's a great property, 14 acres, mostly Pinot, with a little bit of delicious Chardonnay as well. We get crisp, vibrant Chardonnay, and we love the bright red berry intensity that comes out of the Pinot Noir. Further north of the Russian River is Nobles. This is a gorgeous site. Hard to get to, very elevated. It's actually 1,100 feet above sea level, a couple of ridges in from the ocean. Continuing further north, we reach the Anderson Valley, where we have established relationships with several vineyards, including Wiley and Juster. Wiley we've worked with for about 20 years. Here you are at the very northwestern end of the Anderson Valley, up on a ridge. It's flat, sun exposed when there's no fog. It's picturesque. I'm gonna route back to the winery before you hit Philo. You'll hit the Juster Vineyard. At Juster, it's Pinot Noir again. It's close to 30 acres, a site that we leased and planted along the Navarro River in 1998. We like these Anderson Valley sites for the crisp, almost orange citrus nature of the fruit. We really have a great set of vineyards that we work with. It'd be impossible to own them all or to manage them all. And each year, we try 10% new sites in order to continue probing and fine-tuning our mix. Being able to vary allows us to select the very best food grown and also to experiment with new sites that continue to take us further into previously underutilized but exceptional areas for growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. We make vintage-dated sparkling wine absolutely every single year since our first wine. And in order to do that, we have to keep working our coastline and the full range of its vineyards.
just amazing. I love that video. <laughs> So then, oh, that's pretty cool. We we actually just finished it, uh, honestly, like a week ago. So it was fun to insert there. When I watch it, I get I get hungry. I want to go and uh, sample vineyards and uh, and start uh, and start the process again. Right? The um, the the that season, August September, is typically when we're picking our fruit. is very busy, very active, and it and it's really the the moment of the year where we get our reward, where we, we, we harvest the fruit, we taste it, and, and we start the process of making the wines. Um, and it's not that far away, right? It, it's amazing. Your bud break uh, typically is, is kind of a April, you know, maybe, maybe March uh, thing. And, and the next thing you know, we've got uh, flowering and, and here the, the, the vines are really growing right now. And we'll be picking, uh, we'll be picking fruit within, within, uh, you know, two three months you know we'll, we'll be out there and and going all the way into october so we do we our harvest today with the sparklings is starts in august september and, and then we're doing cabernet as i mentioned so that that takes us into uh october typically so we have those that nice range of time i alluded to the in the video the stevens vineyard which is a marin in 2011 uh which was a really late year we actually didn't finish our sparkling season until November, and we were only at 16 bricks with with the the Chardonnay and that really really cool uh, late season. Anyhow, uh, interesting to to uh, give people a perspective on you know the kind of the background, the the DNA behind uh, what we're doing. We'll taste now the second wine, the Blanc Noir that I've got in my lineup. Hey Hugh, so let really me, uh, quick before we move before we move past Chardonnay, we had a yep. question: if you make any unoaked still Chardonnays, just to we, you know, it's a good around. question, and I think that we could probably do it pretty well. We we as I indicated, we're we're doing some red wines, uh, Pinots and Cabs at a, at a different facility. There's a Davies Winery in Santa Elena. Um, and uh, it, it would be it would be interesting to consider. I feel like those red wines are uh, we're getting into our groove there, and so we've we've been uh, and our sparkling wines kind of fit the, the white wine category a, a little bit. But it would be fun to do. So I, I would suspect it at some stage we would. If it were to be completely unoaked, that would be a possibility. Um, honestly, as you taste this Blanc de Blanc, uh, that's a wine that about 20% barrel fermented. Uh, the barrels are neutral, so there's not a lot of oak character in that wine at all, and it is, uh, it's really crisp and tart. So if, if, you, if you like uh, unoaked Chardonnay, which tends to be fairly lean and tart, this might, uh, this, this, this might, this one right here, it happens to be sparkly, but it might be, it might be just what you're looking for. Um, so with that, were there other questions that popped on the board before we uh, jump in and look at the Blanc Noir? I think we got them all. Okay, up. fantastic. Yep, if they I come up that. and I'm not aware, uh, stop me and I'll, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to give a, a reasonably good answer. So the next wine is our Blanc Noir. And this is the wine that we started making in 67. Uh, we talked about Blanc de Blanc, we started making in 65. So that very first vintage in 67, we started doing Blanc Noir. Uh, and the two wines are, are different simply because of the grape. Right, uh, uh, Chardonnay is used to make uh, a Blanc de Blanc, and in our case, we've made our, our Blanc Noir from Pinot Noir. In this particular vintage, 81%, about 19% Chardonnay. Uh, in other vintages, it, it might be 90% Pinot and 10% Chardonnay. So that uh, that balance will change a little bit. But the Pinot, remember, is uh, is, is a much richer style, right? It, it, it we make red wines from Pinot. The the grapes are are red. Um, there typically is a little less vibrant acidity in Pinot Noir, uh, so that's where the Chardonnay plays its role in this blend to, to, to make it a, a bit more brisk. Um, there, the French will refer to the, the masculine character of the, the Noir and the feminine character of the Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay brings uh, a certain polish and elegance. Um, the Pinot always is seemingly a little bit more rustic too, which I think uh, makes it quite interesting. We, um, we've always put it in a clear glass bottle to show off the white wine made from the dark grapes. So you, you see that here. Um, 15 was the vintage that uh, I've referred to, the last of the four drought years. Very early harvest, as early as we've really had. Uh, we started in uh, a very late July with, with the first picking of, of Pinot Noir. So that's unusual. That doesn't, doesn't typically happen like that. Uh, 
low yield. So pretty good. Nice, nice, nice flavor. Uh, our, our cab from 15, I think, is also really outstanding. But it'll be fun to taste this one. One year older. Uh, so at this stage, almost five years old as we, uh, as we taste this uh, particular bottle. Um, there we go. Give it a little uh, sample here. The, the Noir style made from the, 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 the fuller varietal will have a certain creaminess, a certain texture to it, I, which I think is uh, suitable for probably a broader range of foods, both with our, our rosé, which we'll taste, and the, the Blanc Noir. I think these wines can hold up uh, very well uh, in, in situations where you might want to serve a red Pinot Noir. Uh, a, a, a Pinot Noir is a Pinot Noir. If, if it's a white Pinot Noir or a red Pinot Noir, it still has, uh, I think, some of that same depth of, of, of fruit and character. And so in this case, uh, wouldn't hesitate to serve it with a range of poultry preparations, uh, whole fish preparations. Uh, uh, I, I think that there, there are Pinot Noir as a varietal, I think is, is as exciting as there is relative to food because it can really cover a broad range. When you have the juicy steak, okay, we, we then we typically go off with, with a Cabernet. And when we're looking for something really uh, much more lean and crisp. We, we might we might start with with a Sauvignon Blanc or a, a Chardonnay, but the, the Pinot kind of fits a little bit towards the beginning and a little bit towards the end as well. Uh, to me, this nice uh, uh, stone fruit essence of character and in, in the aromas, uh, you get a little bit of that uh, interesting peach nectarine, maybe the hints of plum. Uh, in, in the wine. It's not the, the, the red berry fruit essence that we'll see more in our rosé when, when we get to that one. Uh, I find that sommeliers will often uh, be more intrigued with, with the, the Blanc Noir uh, than our Blanc Noir Blanc. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I, this one has always sat a little bit in the shadow, I think, of our, of our Blanc Noir Blanc. We make less of it. Uh, maybe this one would represent something like 15% uh, of our overall production. Mm -hmm. So uh, two, two distinct brute styles as, as we look at these, Blanc de Blanc made from Chardonnay, Blanc Noir made from Pinot Noir, pretty much that simple. The, the nomenclature a little bit different with sparkling wine where we use this Blanc de Blanc term and Blanc Noir term, as opposed to simply calling one a brute Chardonnay and another a, a, a brute Pinot Noir. As we look at these two, and we, we did a little survey of the vineyards, today more of our Pinot are definitely coming from some of those coastal hills and, and, and uh, pockets uh, in, in real proximity to the fog and the cool ocean air. More of our Chardonnay, uh, some of our Chardonnay coming out for its coast, but really that Carneros district south of us, right at the north end of the, the San Francisco Bay, works really well for Chardonnay. The, the dark loamy soils uh, at, the, at the base of the Sonoma Valley, at the base of the Napa Valley, uh, uh, allow for really high acid re retention as was indicated in the video and just what we're looking for uh, with, with regards to Chardonnay. So uh, interesting to consider those, those two uh, variants. But if you want, we can, we can jump to the, to the next slide. While we're, I, while we're jumping to the next slide, yep. Zachary wanted you to describe the process of acquiring new vineyard sites. In How does that happen? It's, um, it requires, uh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes I think of, of uh, that aspect of our business. It's, it's similar to me to actually selling wine. <laughs> that may sound uh, counterintuitive, but um, there, are, there are a range of sites out there wouldn't it be great to own every last one, right? Well, wouldn't it be great to 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 uh, to own all the restaurants, and then we could make sure that our wine was was uh, was served, right? But we we can't do that. We have to connect with the restaurant tour. We have to connect with the retailer. We have to uh, hopefully make an impression and and make a point of contact that would allow for us to be represented in that location. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're sitting where I am. Um, before we can consider selling the wines, we definitely have to make them. And so we're very motivated to make sparkling wines that will be as delicious as, as this can be made. Uh, we're, we really believe in the terroir of our region and in the potential to make truly world-class sparkling wines. And so as we've, as we've gone about this, we've come to realize that certain pockets uh, 
are really, really outstanding. And, and so there's, uh, just as there might be certain, you know, restaurant and retail partners who would be really outstanding, we want to make sure we connect with them. So we're on, on the other end of the spectrum, working to build those relationships. We're fortunate that we, we started 55 years ago. Uh, so that's a long time. Uh, there aren't too many people in the business today that were in the business, you know, all those years ago, my, my, my dad and, and his colleagues, my mom, uh, they, they're not, they're not with us anymore. We remember them. We, we tried our hardest to, to learn from their example and, and from their uh, knowledge and expertise, but we're also fortunate. And I feel like the generation that'll come after us, they'll, they'll know even more than we do. Right. And so uh, it's, it's been one year at a time, slowly building building those relationships and while we do that learning as we've gone so that's 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 helped us uh, establish that set of vineyards that you saw there uh as we've been able to we've acquired a couple of other properties uh uh if if the resources of the if our pockets were deeper obviously we, we would we'd be excited to acquire more but we have a property the keeper vineyard that we own uh, that was noted in the video in the uh Green Valley area of, of West Sonoma County. Uh, there's a, a Bayview uh, Avenue vineyard that we own, Chardonnay, down in the Carneros. Um, we own our home property here, but that's focused on Cabernet. We've also leased a few of the properties that were noted in the video. So the, the Redding Ranch vineyard high in the hills above Nicasio and Marin County, uh, Pino uh, there, outstanding. And then we have uh, a set of, uh, of other vineyards, but one that we lease that's a little west of Green Valley in, in uh, the Occidental area of Sonoma County, for those familiar, is a Chardonnay and Pinot Vineyard there, Horseshoe Bend it's called, and then another, a 30 acre property that we planted in the Anderson Valley uh, called Juster that, that we, we leased up there. So we, we now have a, a, a bit more of a mix of vineyards that we, we, we own, lease, and, and, and really have more of a direct control of, and then other sites that are outstanding that uh, uh, connect us with, with growers and properties that uh, you know, produce truly outstanding fruit. So it's a, it's a little bit of a mixed bag there. Other questions uh, that uh, are on the, the chat board there? Nope, I think we're ready to uh, move on. We can jump to the next one, okay. Yep. So we did the uh, Blanc Noir 2015. I'm missing some food. <laughs> you know. Even a, a breadstick. <laughs> Normally, I'm down in our tasting room area, and typically we do have a few nibbles uh, for people. Uh, but as we haven't had any guests for a while, uh, there's not much uh, reason to stock up on nibbles. So uh, we'll have to we'll have to think about uh, a little food maybe after this. But I, yes, I love these, these wines. wines. They do make you hungry for sure. They make you hungry. So we're going to do the rosé. The rosé is also 2016. And uh, uh, as we look at this slide, I can talk a little bit. Uh, you've got uh, our, our current team up on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Sean Thompson in the blue shirt uh, on the far left uh, is the director of winemaking, been with us since 2006. Uh, Anton de Villiers, uh, South African, actually giving us a little bit of the uh, uh, worldly uh, experience that he has in the program. And Jessica Koga actually started with us in 2003, is our uh, associate winemaker uh, involved with the reds and the, and the sparklings. Uh, you've got uh, Jesus Calderon, our master Riddler, pictured there in the middle. Uh, and then a couple of shots that, that give you a, a sense for uh, the, the winemaking. We talked about, uh, we didn't talk too much about barrels. We talked about an interest in an unoaked uh, Chardonnay, but we definitely use barrels in our sparkling wine making, not to give wood character, but more a certain subtle, we refer to it as a subtle oxidative richness that can come with a little bit of, of time in barrel. We ferment some lots in barrel, typically 20, 25% of our overall volume uh, will be fermented in barrel before we, we, we blend. And then we also age other lots in barrel for our non-vintage uh, brute, the Mirabelle and Mirabelle Rosé, uh, a, a bit more of, of those barrel aged lots. Uh, but in that one uh, cave barrel shot or barrel cave shot, we have, you can see a, um, a nice range of, of elements that we, uh, that, that some of those barrels actually taste so good. But for our dosage making purposes too, we can come back with something like say 10 years in a barrel and, man, it'll, it'll give a really nice essence of flavor. So perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, 
effort goes into making each one of these things than than, um, than the average consumer might might imagine. Uh, taking it to the most extreme level uh, with our our JSRAM uh, reserve JSRAM rosé, we're, we're tasting our Blanc de Blanc, Blanc de Noir, and and Brut Rosé here that are made in larger quantities and have a little bit more uh, presence in the marketplace. But above these three, we also do uh, three others, a Blanc style we call the JSRAM, a Noir style we call the, the Reserve, and then a Rosé, the JSRAM Rosé. And those will age actually for some seven, eight years in Conte of Yeast, in a bottle, in a cave. Uh, we've even done late disgorged versions of those where we've started to push close to 20 years of age in Conte of Yeast in the bottle. So pretty cool. I know that that's not something that everybody does, uh, but you can, with the, the vibrant acidity that is in the fruit that we start out with, you can you can make these styles that will age for 20 years. And and I know that most people probably never even tasted a 20 year old sparkling wine, but that you know, in our minds, there's a future in that, right? There's, and we have a, we have a good, good group of fans that enjoy uh, some of the library selections that periodically that we'll, we'll offer. So this is our uh, 2016 on the, the Brut Rosé. Again, the, the, the flint glass bottle for the rosé showing off the, the, the nice uh, bright uh, pink essence of, of, of color in this style. I talked a little bit about the use of uh, a Chardonnay in the, the Noir, also Chardonnay in the, in the making of the rosé. So as the stat sheet would indicate, they're about 36 percent uh, Pinot Noir in, in uh, excuse me, Chardonnay in, in, in this blend. Really gives a nice crisp tart backbone because the, the, the Pinot, some of that, typically about 5%, we'll see some skin contact. So that's where we're getting a little color. There are a few, uh, few of the lots that might make their way into the blend that would be slightly riper as well. And so we like to, to give the rosé just a bit more of that, that crisp tart Chardonnay uh, backbone. Uh, what's this, this guy? always a certain juiciness uh, to, to our rosé style that we're producing today that we really like. Um, uh, when, we, when we taste with the, the French champagnes that are twice the, the price in, in terms of this rosé style in particular, uh, we're generally very pleased thinking, yeah, we, 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 we did all right, we did all right. The, and it's back to the, it's, it's really back to some of those coastal sites that we're working with that uh, give us an opportunity to, to do this that isn't quite as recognized as some of the other uh, regions of the world where sparkling wines are produced, but um, we're excited. We welcome uh, uh, those of you listening to come and, and visit us when we're, when we're up and running again. Hopefully it won't be too much longer uh, before we can start receiving guests. I'm gonna give them the little shot of the caves um, that are- So that one, we, so you, there's a shot there inside the caves where the tastings can occur. Uh, and, and again, what's fun about those caves is some of these date back to the 1800s. So we've been, we've been working in these caves for, for a long, long time. Um, the, uh, the stack on the upper right-hand corner there, you're peering into, uh, those bottles are stacked by hand, taken down by hand. And as you saw in a couple other slides, uh, we, we do a fair amount of hand riddling as well. It's, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, manual labor that, that goes into the into the work in the vineyard um, and then also into the into the work of, of, of produ production and making these wines. But we do do tastings uh, at Transferring uh, daily when when we're open uh, and then we do tastings at the Davies Winery in St. Helena as well. So if we are uh, full here at Transferred, we were limited to how many people that we see at both facilities. We have uh, we have the ability to see people now at a, a second facility that uh, is also quite exciting. So at the Davies Winery in St. Helena, where we're making our red wines, we can also taste the Transferred sparkling wines. Similarly, here at Transferred, where we're making our sparkling wines, we can taste uh, a range of the Davies reds. So um, Hugh, Zachary wanted to ask, well, like while we're on the cave slide, um, Zachary, hold on, why won't this move? Zachary wanted to know what were the caves originally excavated for? Surely it wasn't for winemaking. It's crazy, but they were dug for winemaking. And so uh, this property again, founded in 1862. Uh, there, the first bonded winery in Napa County was Charles Crude, founded in 1861. 
uh, as you can imagine, there were not, there were not many people here uh, at that time. And uh, so Shram had pushed, uh, Krug is a little further to the south of us, and St. Lena, another German immigrant. Uh, Shram and Krug were said to, to have worked together uh, there at, in getting Krug's operation up and running. Uh, would have been quite small in, in, that, in, in that first year. Uh, but they had also worked together at Buena Vista, which was another establishment, really the first bonded winery in California, 1857, uh, near the town of Sonoma. Uh, and so uh, these were real pioneers that, that had, had come, uh, German immigrants, um, arrived in, in uh, New York uh, you know, in the 1840s, um, very young, uh, had never heard of the Napa Valley in California before, but would one day make their way here and, and help establish this is the wine growing region that, that uh, we, we know and love today. So interesting. So these caves all dug by hand, uh, the, the, the oldest ones, uh, and originally dug for the purpose of storing wine. Caves give us a cold, dark place to store wine. Uh, and, and so that, that's ideal. We get a lot of rain in this part of the world, and uh, typically, although it's variable, uh, in the winter, and then in the summer, it, it can get pretty hot in the uh, in the late afternoons, and so the caves will will give us a, a a constant environment where we can store our our bottles and or or barrels. As it turns out. My apologies, Vince. I'm sorry that was your question. Zachary actually had a different question um, about how do you see the vineyard site composition of blends changing um, in the past, and how do you see the vineyard site? composition shifting in the future? Well, it's a good question. Uh, as, and as you have a sense, there's a pretty uh, rich depth of sites that we're working with. Those sites that we're working with are, again, focused on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Those are early ripening varietals that, uh, frankly, like to have a little more opportunity to, 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 to ripen. And so as, you, as we go out towards the, the coast where the ocean water is 60 degrees, the, uh, the, the, the heat accumulation, it, it, takes, it takes a long time to really get that warm. And, and so it'll be much warmer in the, the, the north end of Napa Valley where we're physically located than it is out towards the coast. Gradually, uh, there's concern about global warming. The temperature of the ocean hasn't changed a whole lot. So my, we're not seeing that much of a, a, a shift, you know, knock on wood at this stage with, with the climate uh, along the coast itself, uh, still working very well for us. Inland, where, where, where I'm sitting here, and again, back to that map, uh, this is an area where more heat accumulates and some of the hardier red wine varietals have found a, uh, found a really nice home here, right? So uh, Napa Cabernet uh, has worked very, very well. We're hopeful that uh, global warming won't really dramatically shift the, the nature of these regions. Uh, but uh, obviously that is not in our control. I have spent some time in uh, the Mediterranean, uh, actually uh, visiting some of the islands in the Mediterranean in places like uh, Greece and, and Italy, where it's really hot, you know, in, in the summer. And, and you know, the Mediterranean is a different body of water in the Pacific Ocean. It's, it's, it's much more shallow, the water's much warmer, and uh, the air around it is as well. And, and, and frankly, some of those areas are really arid. What's exciting is that they're, they, they make some very delicious wines in some of those areas that, that might give us an indication of, of where we're headed if, if, our, uh, if our climate does change the way that, that uh, some projections have it. So knock on wood, we'll, uh, we'll be doing this for generations to come. That's certainly our plan. So Robert um, wanted to know with the scotch industry using wine casks and rum and even tequila casks to finish their spirits, are you, are you guys selling any of your old oak barrels to this? this we, no one has contacted us and said, hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, granted the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, if you leave, uh, you know, scotch in a barrel for a while. I mean, that, that's going to leave a pretty marked character in, inside that barrel, uh, which uh, in our case, we're, we have really tart, uh, you know, Chardonnay that is, uh, uh, you know, has, almost has, cleans that darn barrel uh, probably a little bit more than, than the, mm -hmm. uh, the, than paints it with the, with the character of the, 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 uh, the liquid that's inside. But hey, 
we have we haven't got there yet. Maybe we're maybe there aren't as many of us doing what we're doing either. So there may not be an awareness of of of, of how it might go. We do periodically need to um, uh, to sell some of the used barrels that that we we have used. So if anybody's interested, uh, <laughs> if, there, if there's a market, let me know because we we'd love to. Uh, we could raise the price uh, you know, of what we get from that. <laughs> and um, this one we're, you know, unfortunately a little too familiar with this question, but um, doctors Rex and Ginger asked how the California wildfires have affected your grapes and the composition of your wines. Uh, interesting question. The, uh, the fires, I, I would say from the perspective, from my perspective anyhow, it, it's really a lot less, uh, my concerns are less about how it might be affecting the character of the wines that we're making. It's more about, uh, and, and, and let's uh, picture the, the, the map image where you see where our winery is tucked away in the, in, in, on a forested hill, right? Um, the, some of these ep fire episodes have really made us concerned that, that that there's danger you know frankly even being here but we're here we love it here and and you know our, we're, we're fully intent on 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 surviving here for 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 a long time to come so we've done quite a bit of work with regards to uh uh forest management on our property uh, others are 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 similarly clearing underbrush uh particularly around buildings around uh really clearing forest around power lines where we've had uh, plenty of fire complications related to power lines. So there is an effort uh, that we're investing in to make our property and I'll say properties more fire safe. Uh, and, and hopefully we, we won't be put to the test that we were particularly 17. You know, some of those fires got a little bit close for comfort. Um, with regards to the wines, I would say that uh, for the sparkling wines, these are these are wines that are not fermented in contact with skins. They're picked earlier in the season, and to be completely honest, we have not noticed anything uh, remotely close to like smoke taint in the uh, in the base wines that we've produced. Um, uh, on the flip side, with Cabernet, uh, which is a later ripening of, of varietal, and then a, a later season is involved. Definitely in 17, there were, there were challenges uh, for, for those of us here in this Napa area. Uh, and we have, that was, that was probably the most pronounced. Um, there are other pockets of the broader uh, you know, West Coast, uh, Oregon, you know, Southern California, where, where there, there have been different experiences with Zinfandel or, or Pinot. For the most part, the, the winemaking conflict uh, is associated with those red varietals, a later season fermenting, uh, the juice in contact with skins that may have a little uh, uh, smoke, uh, you know, taint uh, in the skin, and then oh, okay, that can get into your your wine. And so we're um, it hasn't presented too much of a problem to us uh, personally, but we have definitely had some Cabernet lots that that didn't pass muster, uh, and uh, and so then you have to try to sell that in the bulk market, and it it you take a loss, you know, on on those lots. And any more questions? I think we are pretty close to wrapping up. I, sorry, I have. Well, I wanted before uh, we break, uh, uh, Jenny, uh, thank you uh, for, for, for hosting the, the tasting, connecting me to our, our friends in Indianapolis. We're, we're excited to, uh, to, to have people that are interested in what we're doing. Thankful for that. Um, and, um, we wish everybody the best, honestly, through what is uh, kind of uncharted territory. I know there is some uncertainty as to exactly you know, what the economic impact of all this will be, you know, what, what the health impact of all this will be, but our hearts go out to those most profoundly impacted. And um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful that, that we've seen the worst and that, that better, better, one thing's certain, better days will do lie ahead. And so maybe with that good thought, We'll raise a glass and and, and thank say you. thank you to everybody. Come and thank visit us uh, when when you can. We'll we'll be excited to see you here in Absolutely. This has been the one unexpected gift is to be able to interact with you a lot more than I have in the past. And I'm glad that you're you <laughs> you, <laughs> my market. You've been good. You've been good at lining up the tasting. So that's I, uh, I love, appreciate it. I love having you. So you are welcome anytime. <laughs>
on my screen. Okay. <laughs> no, well, we have to we have to pivot and, and evolve and do things slightly differently. We're doing we're doing a pretty cool a virtual tasting series on uh, on Fridays up in our kitchen, and so there we do a little food and wine. But if any of the listeners are there and want to join us uh, tomorrow at five. We'll actually be looking at some of the uh, green practices that we're involved with, both in vineyards and the winery, and then a few of the select wines that we're making that come from uh, what we call Napa Green Vineyard. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, again, a big thanks to everybody. Cheers. Cheers, Hugh. Talk to you soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks, Hugh. Cheers. Thank you. Is that Mark? Yes. Yeah, that's Mark. I didn't, I, I saw your square light up. Be safe, Thank you guys. You. Yes. Thanks, Stay well. thirsty. Okay, bye. Give our best to the team. Thank Cheers. Will Thank do. you. Go, Indiana. I have one quick question. If, I know they're like children, so you can't really pick a favorite, but if you had to, which one would be your favorite? Of the three that we just tasted? Yes. Mm. I'd probably say the J Shram, but we didn't taste that one today. Uh, the the uh, no, they're all honestly they're 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 kind of different. They're like children, so you're right there, but they're also different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Chardonnay is different than Pinot Noir, and so there are definitely moments when I'll want to have the the the, the Chardonnay, right? I'll, or I want to have a, a a lean, crisp, whiter white wine style, you know. And then there are other times when I'll want to have the the roundness of the, that the Pinot Noir brings um the uh so i'm i'm yeah i which one do i drink the most it seems like we, we're drinking a fair amount of rosé at least in our house i know my wife and her friends love the rosé um it's a nice dry rosé but there's really beautiful kind of vibrant uh, red fruit there and so um and i would say of all the ones that the rosé also doesn't seem to need uh it, it's it's almost it, it's um it doesn't need the food quite as much. I mean, you can serve it with food, don't get me wrong, and it would go to the broad range. But all by itself, it's pretty easy to, you know, drink glasses of the rosé all day. Oh, yeah. So, rosé all day. Rosé all day. There you go. Um, it's, a, it's a thing, right? It's, it, it, it started <laughs> 20 years ago. It wasn't there. But now, now it's a thing, rosé all day. And for my other question, do you, do you have a day shrimp uh, in store? We, I don't know if it's uh, in, in uh, we would sell a little bit in Indiana every year. If, mm -hmm. if it's not something that, that you guys have access to, uh, let us know. We can certainly uh, work with a wholesaler think, to get it there. Well, uh, I'll, talk to, I'll, talk to, I'll talk to Jim about it. I think we have a couple of cases, but we can certainly get some more from California very easily. So, the, uh, but that one is really tasty. The current vintage, uh, 2010, is uh, was like the number 29 in the wine enthusiast top 100 seller selections of the year last year. 97 points, but it was a really, really nice wine. And it's it's a it's a richer style. It's got some age than more age than the Blanc de Blanc, but with that really crisp entry, long finish, pretty tasty. Uh, the the reserve is is also. That's the richest style that we make, right? It's the aged Pinot Brut, and and it's it's pretty special yes. wine. There there is strength to the palate um, from and from the tart Chardonnay, but the rich yeah. kind of oxidative nature of that wine is is pretty special. If if you like Bollinger and Krug, the Strangler Reserve is is pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you. Thank you, you guys. Great group. All right, Hugh, you have a wonderful evening and I will talk to you very soon. You got it. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Mark. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay safe. We'll, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Cool.